Hello, thank you for joining us for a live conversation about COVID-19 in Idaho. I'm Nicole Foy, an investigative reporter for the Idaho Statesman. Uh, since the last live Q&A that my colleague Audrey Dutton hosted last month, more than 800,000 vaccine doses have been administered in Idaho. Of those, more than 326,000 people are now fully vaccinated. Everywhere you look, you can see touching stories of families reuniting for the first time in months after vaccination. The Idaho Statesman actually just published a few of those stories today. So if you're looking for a little bit of hope, I would go check it out. Um, Idaho is also making progress on tackling inequities in vaccine access and uptake, especially among the state's racial and ethnic minorities. For example, increasing number of Latinos, the state's largest mi minority group, and a community that bore a disproportionate share of the state's cases for much of the pandemic's course in Idaho are also getting the vaccine. But our state and country still have quite a few hurdles left. Uh, more contagious variants are spreading and seem to be transmitted more easily by younger people and children, just as many students are returning to in-person classes. And of course, Idahoans are still losing their lives every week to COVID-19 as the state continues to inch towards its 2000th um, COVID-19 death. Despite all this, it's becoming easier and easier to ask and imagine what does life after vaccination look like? What precautions should we still be taking? And what can we look forward to? I'd like to introduce our guest who, as we're always lucky, um, we're incredibly lucky to learn from these two experts in Idaho healthcare who can hopefully help us make a little bit of sense of what's happening. So first we have, as usual, um, Dr. David Pate. He spent a decade leading St. Luke's Health System, the state's largest healthcare provider. He now helps advise Governor Brad Little on Idaho's pandemic response. He blogs at drpatesblog.com, and you can find him on Twitter, where he is answering many questions all the time at at drpatesblog. We also have Dr. Tommy Alquist. He is a former um, ER doctor, the CEO of BVA Development, and co-founder of Crush the Curve Idaho, a nonprofit that got its start with COVID-19 testing, but now helps arrange vaccine clinics. Its first clinic vaccinated more than um, 1,100 people the first time, and I believe there is another clinic today, if I've got my dates um, right. You can find uh, Tommy on Twitter at, at Tommy Alquist. Thank you both for joining us. Great to, Glad be, to be with you. Uh, so we've already received many, many questions from statesman readers who are also curious about life after vaccination and what that could look like in Idaho. So we're going to start answering those pretty soon. If any of you watching today have questions, please leave them in the comments of this video's um, live stream on Statesman's Facebook and the YouTube pages. We're going to be monitoring those live. But first, though, I have a question that seems to me maybe a little bit obvious, and I don't mean to be a downer after talking about all this hope, but I do have this question. You know, we were in many parts of the country, it doesn't seem like we're in a race against time, against those extra contagious variants that are spreading. Is it too soon to be talking about life after vaccination? Do either of you think that we could still have to prepare for another wave of cases? You want to go first, Tommy? Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll go first and then I can't wait to hear what David has to say. So yes, we're too soon. I, I think every time David and I talk, it's it's there's so much good. And I think the vaccine rollout has accelerated and we've been pleasantly surprised by so much good. And there's some problems too, I'm sure we'll get into today, but we're doing a really good job of getting that out there, but it's just too soon. I think people were so tired of of the just the, the deal and wanting to get back together so soon. I was in a meeting this morning, uh, another business meeting, and a couple of people in the be meeting just shocked me how they were just like, we're so sick of this. We're done. I don't care anymore. And uh, got pretty angry in the meeting. And I'm like, you know, that's where a lot of people are. They're just ready to be done. But gosh, David, we've been saying all along, if we could have just wait, we, you know, there's still people losing their lives. There's still, you know, the percentage of people not vaccinated is still really high. You know, even if we save another hundred lives in the next few months in 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 Boise or our area, let's just hold on a little longer. Another thing I would say that really frustrates me, and I said this this morning in my business meeting, is how has wearing a mask harmed me this last year? Mm -hmm. And I, I asked the whole group. I mean, how has it really harmed me? So if, if I'm asked by public health officials to hold on a little longer, to social distance a little longer, to just be a little careful for my fellow men, dang it, I'm going to do that. So I think that's what I would say is we're not we're not there yet. I wish we I wish it wasn't like it is. Vaccination's going well, but we're not there yet. And David will talk a little bit more about these variants, I'm sure. But but I wish we could hold on a little longer to save a few more lives. 
Yeah, <clears throat> I think Dr. Alquist has hit it on the head. We are close. We are getting to the, where we can see light at the end of the tunnel, but we're still in the tunnel. And, uh, and, and we shouldn't get complacent. And in fact, the very behavior that Dr. Alquist described where people are just throwing up their hands, say, I'm done with it, is what will actually make it more likely that we have a, another surge. Um, I, I've been predicting that uh, we would have a fourth surge since February, uh, not because I have any magic uh, ball to look into, but I just I've been looking at what's happening across the rest of the world. I'm looking at what's happening in Europe, and they often uh, precede us by several weeks or, or, or a month or so. And um, I'm seeing what's happening there. Uh, and when I would warn people about that, well, that's Europe. Well, you know, you got to remember, we're not fighting an Idaho coronavirus or a U.S. coronavirus. This is a world coronavirus. And if we should learn anything from this, it's that this virus anywhere in the world is a threat to the United States. It didn't start in the United States, and yet here we are. So we do have to pay attention to the world. But when they wouldn't pay attention to Europe, I said, okay, let's look at Canada. Canada's struggling right now. You look at their hospitals and, and they're getting to capacity problems. And guess what? I, I said, not only will we have this fourth rate wave, I'm afraid, uh, but also it's going to be different. And the age group that is going to impact is 30 to 39. And why do I say that? Well, that's what happened in the UK. And why? We don't know for sure, but it's a pretty good sense and growing sense that it's because unlike before the variants, kids were not a major source of infection or transmission. That's different with the UK variant. And they do become a much bigger player in this. And those 30 to 39 year olds are probably their parents. And because kids will still a lot of times be asymptomatic or not be infected, but they bring it home. And this is what the schools have missed. The schools have focused on, well, the kids don't get sick and we're getting teachers vaccinated. Well, that's not the whole story here. And so that's the part that we're missing. And in fact, if you look at Canada, what are the age groups that they're seeing in their, their ICUs? 20 to 40 year olds. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's happening. And then you could say, well, but you know, that's Canada. Okay, well then let's look at the United States. And so you can look at Michigan, you can look at New Jersey. Uh, there's a lot of places you can look at here. And what are they seeing? Same thing. And where are we seeing outbreaks right now? Youth sports. Uh, and that's what we're seeing. Had a big outbreak in Minnesota uh, due to that. And things that we got away with before the variant, you're less likely to get away with with the variant. And and in fact, uh, you know, I talked with the CEO of uh, uh, a prominent health system uh, uh, in the Northeast. And he said, you know, you go in when when I go in last year and look at our ICUs, it was 60, 70 and 80 year olds. I go in now it's 20, 30 and 40 year olds. And so. And, and why do I uh, express concern about them? Because before the variants, even if 30 and 40 year olds got infected, they, they typically did okay. Uh, well, the reasons I get concerned is number one, uh, the UK variant is there's growing evidence that it does cause more severe illness. And that seems to be what we're seeing. Second, that's the age group that hasn't been vaccinated yet by and large. Now, this is where I wanna give a shout out to Dr. Alquist and Crush the Curve, having these mass vaccinations and making it easy for people, that's fantastic. We need people to get vaccinated. The third reason is if you look at the long haulers, which you know this is looking like it's, it's not an insubstantial number of people, what's the age group that is most prominent in this? 30 to 40 year olds. Uh, so I, I think that we need to take this seriously. It's just a couple more months. We just, it's, it's like you said at the very opening, Nicole, it's this race of getting people vaccinated 
ahead of the growth in the, the variants. I was just concerned variants are going to beat us. So far, it looks like they're going to beat us. Um, but that's it's and like everything in this pandemic, it's always been in our control. It's just whether we decide to exercise that control. We we know how to stop this virus in its tracks. It's are we willing? And that's the big problem. Nicole, can I add one more thing um, that, that I didn't say? Um, well, first of all, thank you, because I, this is the first time I've actually met you and it's virtually. <laughs> but but Nicole, I've been following you this last year and watching you with passion and such art um, report on the Latina the Latino community that and others that have been left behind in this pandemic. And I think early on they were left behind and ignored kind of in testing and keeping them safe. And then I think later on you've watched these vaccine rollouts where it's been who you know and how you know how to navigate the system that's been with the vaccines. It just flat out has, right? Mm -hmm. So the other reason to hold on a little longer is even though if you come from a middle or upper middle class family and you have friends and family that know how to navigate the systems, you can get on your, you know, you can navigate the waste lists and how I'm gonna sign up and you're not nervous about signing up, you're fine. <laughs> there are still a lot of people in this state that are disadvantaged that we're, we're, I mean, we spend a lot of our time at Crush the Curve. I think you've been very helpful meeting with those communities, trying to send out uh, mobile units to them to make it a little easier at their place of work to get vaccinated. They're not vaccinated yet and they're mm -hmm. elderly. And they're at risk and they're in uh, some of the places that they work. They're in confined spaces. They're not there yet. So shame on my friends this morning in my meeting saying, hey, screw this. We're done. Because they might say that coming from a rich, white, upper class status in their life. But they are ignoring. And frankly, it's disappointing the rest of the people that don't have that advantage in their life. And man, congratulations. Thank you for 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 constantly keeping that awareness up for us for this last year. Thank you. Oh, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I do have a quick follow-up question for you two on this though, is that, you know, now that we've established that despite how excited we are to look at the after, um, we might not quite be there yet. And many of the things we will be talking about today, we still need to handle with a little bit of, of, of precaution. And so I'm curious, is there a benchmark you're going to be looking at that makes you say, yes, this is life after vaccination, or is it going to be a gradual change over a longer period of time? Well, I, I think it's both, uh, Nicole. Uh, it, it, this is going to be gradual. There's not going to be a time where we can just flip the switch and say, okay, it's it's over and it's behind us. Uh, we've lost that opportunity. Uh, you know, we had an opportunity early on uh, to to quash this. And, and we as a world, we missed that opportunity. Uh, now we're having an opportunity to vaccinate ourselves out of this. And we're missing that opportunity too. We're not getting enough people uh, vaccinated. And uh, even though the United States is relatively speaking, doing well with respect to vaccinations, there's something like 30 countries that haven't, not one person's gotten the vaccine yet. And I, I hear projections that it may take another two years uh, to get some of these countries vaccinated. I want to go back to the point I made in, in answering your prior question. This is not an Idaho phenomenon. This is not a U.S. phenomenon. This is a world issue. If we don't stop the transmission of this virus everywhere in the world, we will continue to have transmission. And with transmission, we're likely to get new variants. And again, you know, we can probably respond to those and get a new vaccine, but that's what's going to push us to have to keep on getting, you know, recurrent vac vaccinations because we let it continue to spread. And that's why, you know, it, it drives Dr. Alquist and myself uh, uh, crazy when we see our leaders, uh, our elected leaders, don't even follow this advice. And, and, and like Dr. Alquist said, I don't, I don't like wearing a mask. It's no big deal though. Uh, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it's not like I have to give up a kidney to be able to be safe from COVID It's wear a darn mask. But yet we've seen our legislature won't wear masks. We've seen the white house 
in the previous administration wouldn't wear masks. And we've seen what happens. Science is going to win out. And and but it's such a terrible message. And and for the life of me, I can't figure out why, because it should be clear now that the this issue about controlling the virus or the economy, they're not two separate choices. It's one choice. And, you know, you uh, you ask uh, businesses and we'll I know we'll get into this later. You ask businesses what how are they being impacted by people who are at risk that decide not to come there to give them their business because they're scared because people aren't wearing masks or aren't getting vaccinated or whatever. But yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a long, gradual uh, time uh, to answer your question about a specific measure. Yes. What I'm going to be following is on the state website and for the country and for the world. Uh, I'm going to be watching what are those seven day moving averages of daily new cases per hundred thousand. So Idaho, I, I think the last time I checked, I think we're around 15, uh, 15 16 that number needs to get down to one or less and stay there for months. And then I'll think we're, we're probably, we're probably there. I don't have much to add to that. That was a, a brilliant answer. I, I would say that it's helpful, Nicole. It's a, it's a brilliant <laughs> question because I think people from all parts of life are saying, okay, what is the metric we're after? And I do think a lack of understanding or clarity to that answer is not helping us. So I, I appreciate what Dr. Mm -hmm. Pate said is let's let's be more vocal about a goal for a region or for a state. Let's be more vocal about where we want to get with vaccinations. Let's set some goals that are super clear and crisp and out there. Because I do, mm -hmm. I do think that helps us with messaging. And I think that unfortunately, this pandemic has shown us that in a leadership and information vacuum, it will be filled by crazy stuff, right? And so I like to fill that up with answers because if you can, and if you can talk to people and out message the crazy, then you kind of chase away the crazy. So I hope that we can get better messaging about, hey, let's try to get this many people vaccinated. Let's get our numbers down to this. Let's, let, you know, with some clarity, because I do think it will help us uh, uh, fight some of that counter messaging. Yeah, and, and Nicole, I, I would just add, I, I think Dr. Alquist is spot on. I, I think having people focus on <clears throat> that number, getting those uh, cases down, also is advantageous because our discussion has been around herd immunity and what percent of the population needs to get vaccinated. Look, nobody knows. Uh, and so that's that's a real problem because, frankly, there's a lot of people out there that think that, oh, well, you know, it, we're in good shape because of all the people vaccinated. I don't think any expert thinks that's the case, but it's because they don't have a metric. They don't know. And so I, I think rather focusing on what percent of the community needs to have immunity or what percent needs to be vaccinated, because we don't know. The proof in the pudding is what I said when those cases are when we achieve herd immunity those cases will get down and they'll stay down. That's yeah. how we'll know. Yeah. Well, I have another question here, kind of pulled out of um, some recent news. Um, yesterday, Governor Brad Little signed an executive order uh, banning any state of Idaho um, agency or entity from requiring a phrase we've heard a lot now, so-called vaccine passports. So I'm just curious, What's your reaction to that news? And also maybe can we talk a little bit about what different people mean when we're talking about vaccine passports? Are they useful? Do Are we using them that phrase correctly? <laughs> I'll just be honest. Yeah, yeah. And I'll just be honest. I, I thought it was a political stunt. Uh, <laughs> I think he's rallying to his base because everyone's freaking out. The same people that didn't want to comply. It's the same people in, in our party saying, I don't want to comply with anything. I don't want a mask. Mm -hmm. I want my freedom. Don't tell me what to do. Well, now a vaccine's available. And logically, lots of people are going to say, hey, if you are vaccinated, you're going to have the ability to do things that people that aren't vaccinated aren't. That's a medical thing. That's a science thing. That's not a political thing. So I think it was a political stunt to throw some bones to the right wing of the Republican parties. 
say, oh, there you go. We're not going to allow this in Idaho. But in reality, whether I'm a business or I'm an event or I'm, it's going to make a difference if you've been vaccinated or not. And so again, I think that they try to scare people and say, oh, now you're going to have this card and the government's going to track you. And that's not true. It's just going to make a difference if you're vaccinated or not for what you're going to be able to do and how safe you are. And so David, I don't know. We haven't talked about this, but that's what I thought it was and call it what it is. Yeah. And, you know, I I agree with Dr. Alquist. This isn't really going to make much of a difference. Uh, It's not going to be any particular state government that drives this issue. Uh, So let's just think about it pragmatically. And I like what uh, Dr. Alquist said. Let's just take the politics out of it a minute. Uh, So let's just look at this pragmatically. If I don't believe this is going to happen, but if if let's say we get down to these really low levels soon and there's just not much COVID uh, transmission, uh, we don't have people filling up hospitals, we don't have a lot of deaths, at that point, no one's going to care. However, if we still have a, a, a fair amount of, of cases transmission, and especially if we start getting even more dangerous variants, people will care. And, and then it's going to be a matter of, well, let's look at the population. So to get to these levels that are going to suppress it is certainly theorized that we're going to have to get somewhere 70, 80 percent of people vaccinated. It, as we get more and more people that are already vaccinated, actually vaccinated people are going to be in favor of this. Uh, and when they become the majority, that's going to be a factor. The other thing is it gets back to the point that I made before. This is going to be driven by two things, um, particularly foreign countries and private businesses. So uh, let, let's just uh, take take a business that has thin margins and has to can only get a, a profit by filling up its capacity. And let's say that um, it's something that fills that capacity is older people. So let's take fine dining. You don't see a lot of 20 and 30 year olds at fine dining, except maybe prom. Uh, that's not where those restaurants are making their business. If you have to have 80, 90 percent of your restaurant filled to break even or make money and you depend on 90 percent of those people being uh, seniors and you don't give them assurance, it's going to hurt your business. Probably uh, think of another business cruises. Uh, you know, seniors go on cruises and and support the cruise industry. And we had last year a big problem with cruises being a source of outbreaks. It would not surprise me if a number of cruises start saying we're only taking vaccinated passengers because not because they're trying to keep people out, but they know they won't get the customers they need unless they do this. And so, you know, we've already heard this about entertainment uh, venues, uh, sports venues. uh, And if you turn out uh, that uh, because Americans don't take this seriously and we don't control it, and eventually most of the rest of the world is, we're going to face what we found before that there were there were a lot of countries that said we're not taking people from the U.S. back at the beginning when we were in control, and and that you could certainly see them saying you're going to have to have evidence of of immunization to come. So, regardless of what Idaho does or doesn't do, Florida, Texas, um, it's going to be driven by a lot of other things. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm and I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Pate, if you could uh, clarify maybe a. Um, a question that I've heard a lot, which is, is it really so unprecedented to require vac- mm-hmm. certain vac- vaccinations or immunizations? No, it's not. Uh, so first of all, uh, in a lot of schools, you have to show your vaccination record or you have to give them a appropriate exemption. So we do this in a lot of U.S. schools. Um, I can tell you in healthcare organizations, every healthcare organization I've worked for, I have to show that I got evidence of I've had measles or if I can't show that I've been vaccinated for it, that I've got antibodies for it. Uh, If you want to travel, a lot of destinations uh, require 
uh, vaccines. Uh, it's a lot of countries that require yellow fever vaccine or, or other things. So no, this is not uh, unprecedented at all. Thank you. So I have a, a third question from me and then we'll move into reader questions. But I have to say several readers sent a version of this one. So I think I'm um, speaking for, for a lot of people here. Um, do you have any advice for talking to, um, you know, talking through concerns that friends and family may have about getting a COVID-19 vaccine? This is a really stressful and emotional topic for many for many families, many friends. Um, and so I'm curious, you guys both have a lot of expertise, a lot of public expertise, and I'm sure that you may have run into this professionally or personally. So um, I guess, Dr. Alquist, if we could start with you first, do you have any advice? Yeah, my first advice, and, and you're right, we do this a lot, is ask this first simple question, what are your concerns and, and why do you have them? You know, and, and listen first, I mean, you know, God gave us two ears, one mouth for a reason. And I think if you listen first, um, then you'll understand where you're starting from. Uh, because I found a lot of times where I'm starting is just really bad misinformation. And the second I'm able to listen to where the concern's coming from, uh, validate that concern and say, gosh, boy, if that's what you're hearing, I can I can understand why you would be so nervous and upset. And then, and then kind of walk through the science and, and, and probably the, with real information, um, kind of get through that. So that, that's the first thing is, is, is validating the concern and understanding where, where they're starting from. The second thing is there is a lot of really good information and data and science out there for someone that is willing to understand and, and, and valid concerns. You know, what does this mean for, for, for you know, where, where I'm starting from with certain health conditions I have or, or my concerns about, you know, the future? What do we know and what don't we know about this vaccine? But I think you can get there very quickly if you listen to people. Um, and and that, that that's my simple thing. Because everyone, it's hard to have a, a canned answer because everyone's concerns are going to be different. I mean, you know, a, a young lady's concerns is going to be very different than someone. But I think once you understand, is it politically motivated? Is it sincere? Is it based on science? Or, or where are we coming from? And then the other thing I'll tell you, Nicole, is there's a lot of people that just don't want the answer, right? They don't want to hear anything about this that's the truth. And you also understand that early on. And, and frankly, in those conversations, I try to keep it really respectful, but understand that I'm, I'm probably not going to get anywhere with this person because no matter what I say, they are going to be an anti-vaxxer and think this whole thing's a conspiracy and they're putting microchips in us. And, and sometimes that's where it ends is just, hey, we'll have to agree to disagree on this. I don't think that's the case. And, and, and I have a lot of those conversations too with, with by the way, with good friends and family. Yeah, I, I think Dr. Alquist's uh, answer was fantastic. It, uh, let me just emphasize a few of his points. That, that first one of just listening, because as he said, uh, you know, as I talk to people, they've got a hundred, there's a hundred different reasons that people have come up with not to take the vaccine. I don't want to argue all hundred of them. So I'd like to know, okay, Nicole, if you're hesitant to get the vaccine, it, it, tell me why, what are you worried about? So I think that listening and trying to find out what their particular concern on is, is most important. Second thing is, I loved Dr. Alquist's answer about just kind of the, not only just listening, but showing that you care and you respect them and that they could have a valid reason why they're, they're hesitant. And we don't want to shame people or deride them because they're not getting the vaccine. We want to be empathetic and understand and just make sure that they have the correct facts to make their decision about. Uh, the third thing I would say that I would add to what he said is th those people, he's right. There's some people, uh, you know, you can spend the next two weeks constantly talking to them. If you want to, you're not going to get anywhere. So you not, need to know when to kind of uh, cut your line and move on. Um, and I have that in my family. I have uh, one person who was hesitant and I was able to talk to her and alleviate her concerns. I've got other members in my family. Um, uh, it's, I'm not going to waste my time. It's not going to happen. But I do think with those people, we still want to say, look, I understand you're not going to get it now. If later, if what you're seeing changes, if you're starting to have thoughts about it, if you want to talk again, you just reach out to me and I'll be happy to talk you through it when you're ready. 
-hmm. Yeah, and that's a good point that both of you made is that people have a variety of concerns about this and Absolutely. some can be answered with with you know questions you know answers that they haven't heard and in some kind of tie to other beliefs. Um, so I'm going to get into our first reader questions. We are still getting some over Facebook as well. So again, to anyone listening, um, watching with us, please remember that if you have a question or something you want to follow up on, please feel free um, to send it to us and we'll try to get to it. But the first one we have here is from um, William in Boise. Uh, he says he's a volunteer on the Pfizer vaccination trial that was based out of Meridian. So he's been fully vaccinated since last September. And he's curious about what the expected efficacy period will be for this vaccine and for others. Will it be different? Does it seem likely we might need still need booster shots? Uh, Dr. Pate, do you want to start with that one? Sure. <clears throat> uh, yes, it, it certainly could be different among the different vaccines. So we'll be looking at each vaccine it itself. I, I certainly would be surprised if we saw a significant difference between Pfizer and Moderna because it's the same technology. There are some fine points, but obviously that would raise a series of questions if we found those were different. But, but those vaccines certainly could be different than the Janssen and Janssen vaccine, or, or the Janssen uh, vaccine rather, that is a, a different technology and some of the others. So yes, uh, uh, the, the other thing is, is that we've got so far really good news. And I want to thank uh, your listener for volunteering into that trial, because the only reason we know what we know is because people volunteered and said they'd be part of the study. And what we know is Pfizer just released their data uh, saying that at at six months, so, so obviously that's none of us uh, that hadn't been offered that long. It's the study participants that they've rechecked six months later and uh, still uh, over a 90 percent uh, efficacy rate, which is wonderful. I mean, we were hoping in the beginning for 60 and, and maybe could we get to 70? I mean, this is unbelievably good. So that's six months. Um, now, we know it's at least six months. It may be more. It may be a year. It may be two years. It may be five years. Not too many of us think this is going to be lifetime, but um, we're not ruling that out. But I think what's going to be the issue for when we need next vaccines are two things. If in those study groups like him, if we see after a point in time that there is a significant drop in their neutralizing antibody titers, then, and that tends to be happening in that whole population, then of course uh, they'll recommend a booster. The other thing is these variants. Uh, and, and as long as we continue to allow these variants to spread and new ones to emerge, then we're gonna be facing the issue of periodically, do we need to update the vaccine? So uh, good news so far, but we don't know how long they're gonna last. Yeah, and I, one of the things that I, a story I like telling just from our careers, uh, Dr. Pate is, um, Immunology is complicated, right? <laughs> it's just really yeah. complicated. And it's it, it, people want a yes, no, six <clears throat> months, 12 months. They want those answers, but we don't know what we don't know yet. And, and furthermore, I always kind of tell the hepatitis B story. So hepatitis B is something that you don't want to get if you're a healthcare wor worker. It's a vaccine that's required by healthcare <clears throat> facilities for their workers. And you, and you draw a titer on it, okay? So when you start as an employee in the emergency room, they'll say, hey, we need to draw your blood to see if you have antibodies to hepatitis B. And different people just react very differently. And so, you know, in healthcare, we go through that and we realize that, you know, David and I may have gotten the vaccine, but we may be completely different in the way we develop antibodies and the yeah. way we maintain our immunity. And so I think we're more familiar with, with not knowing all those answers and we're okay with that because it's immunology. And I think you've got the general public that, that's just tired of COVID that are doing their best to, to make things happen and they want answers and they're saying, okay, is it gonna be six months? And we're saying, we don't know. And that's really frustrating. Is it gonna be 12 months? We don't know. But what I what I've really loved and I've appreciated this about, about Dr. Pate since the beginning, he, he in a very, very clear way is explaining to lay people what we're up against and what we're gonna know over time. And those answers just have to be good enough for now because we will know a year from now a lot more than we know now. And we're gonna know a oh, lot yeah. more about about you know some of the 
the different immunity that we get and how long it lasts and what a booster will be like. And so if you have enough time to sit and talk through someone with those answers, then they're like, oh, okay, I get it. But when you're starting, they're just like, well, I'm just tired of this. No one will give me a straight answer. So it's a lot of patience and it's waiting and it's following science and it's reading and it's being engaged. Um, and, and, and that's why that's what I love these forums so much. Cause I think a lot of people get some of those answers, but they've been waiting for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, one of these new normal questions that we're, we're, we're looking at hopefully from Carly in Mountain Home, um, they ask, uh, do you anticipate the public ever being able to safely gather in larger crowds unmasked? And then also just what is that new normal going to look like? Maybe it might be more helpful to look at this at six months out, a year out. I don't know. However, you're comfortable discussing that. Um, Dr. Alquist, do you want to start there? Yeah. So I think, I think, yeah, there's a lot of, we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to get through this. Um, that's, that's the point. I mean, I think if, mm -hmm. you know, there, we're, we're now entering a new phase, Nicole, where you got people that, you know, everyone that wanted the vaccine, it's, uh, they're done. And now we know that we're going to need to go to people and encourage people and have a, a, a proactive campaign. We know that it's over 200% more likely to vaccinate someone at their place of work than it is to get them to come to you. So we're going to need to have vaccine outreach clinics. And it's not that people don't want to, it's just that you need to make it easier for them. So we're going to have a lot of work to do now to get from, you know, April, May, where there's still people that want the vaccine to June, July, where we're going to actually take the vaccine out to people that are going to take it. Uh, that's one unknown we don't know. But hopefully there's a lot of people out here that really are going to get vaccinated. And, and, and that race against variants is going to tell us a lot. But if we can get out to people and if we can really vaccinate our population in Idaho and in the United States, then we can we can do a really good job of getting as many people that will be vaccinated, vaccinated. You're going to get back to a sense of normal pending. One thing is what Dr. Pate always brings up. What do the variants do? You know, what are they like and how sick do they make us? Um, but the good news for everybody is we've just gone through this incredible year where we have developed these great vaccines in a really short period of time, something that traditionally would have taken many, many years to do. We did in a short period of time. That technology is up and running. Uh, we'll follow these variants closely. So I'm very hopeful that by fall, if, if we really stick to this, that we're going to be able to gather in large groups and have some sense of normal when we're watching football. And But but there's just a, you know, we're in we're in April and that's a long ways away. And a lot of it depends on our behavior. A lot of it depends on our response. A lot of it depends on the response of our people. Because even as good as we are as getting that vaccine out there, how many people end up taking it? Uh, so all those questions will determine what life looks like next fall even. Yeah, I, I think Dr. Alquist is exactly right. We we will get there. I, I know we will. There will come a time where we get back to something at least pretty close to, to normal. But as Dr. Alquist said, it's it's in our hands and it's up to us how soon that is going to be. We can do it the easy way or we can do it the hard way. So far, we've been doing it the hard way. <laughs> and uh, but, uh, you know, what's going to drive this is can we keep the transmission of the virus down? And so until we get vaccinated in sufficient amounts, that means we still have to stay home if we're sick. We still need to distance. We still need to wear a mask if we're out. But once we get to that level, and remember, we'll know that because the cases will dive and get down to that below one and stay there. Uh, and I think it is possible by, um, uh, next fall. Uh, but we have to remember it's, it's in our hands. What is it going to take? So when you think about what herd immunity is, it's the number of people that are, have immunity. So that's the numerator divided by all the people who can get infected and transmit the virus. So what has to be included in the denominator is kids. They do get the virus and they can transmit it. Now, really good information about coming out about some of the vaccine trials in, in kids. And I think it's very possible that soon the FDA may give approval for us to vaccinate 11 to, to 16. Uh, and so what I think is important, because I hear from parents all the time, we want our kids in school. 
So do I. What are you willing to do to make that happen? What you need to do, if you want to have kids full in person next year, then you need to get yourself vaccinated and you need to take your kids in to get vaccinated. And that's probably going to be over the summer as soon as they are eligible by age, once the FDA approves it. And the more people get vaccinated, the sooner we get back to normal. And on that note, I, I want to follow up with something that was already a little bit touched on in the beginning, but we have a question um, from a reader, uh, Tabarak in Boise, um, kind of on this topic. How will kids that are not vaccinated impact others? So in another way, can they still s spread the sickness even if their parents are vaccinated? And Dr. Pate, you just we're just talking about this. Yes, play in. we were. And, and I think what's important, I... I feel badly. I have tried to help uh, school boards understand this. Uh, they they seem to be stuck in the mind, as as actually most people I talk to, that what happens with COVID in kids is what we saw last year and up to now. It's different with the variants, and, and we have to understand that and some other people have said this, it's almost like we have a new pandemic. We have a different virus now that we're dealing with. And this UK variant acts differently. The transmission characteristics are different. It still transmits in the same way. So all the things that we've talked about to mitigate this, those still work. But what I'm talking about is the, the transmission characteristics change. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that whereas before, we didn't seem to have many infections in kids. You get a lot more infections in kids with the UK variant. Before, when the kids didn't tend to transmit the virus so much, you get a lot more transmission with the UK variant. And uh, so until we can get kids vaccinated, they are gonna continue to be part of spreading this. And, and, and in fact, that is what we're used to with, for example, influenza. Kids are the big driver of influenza epidemics that we have every year and through schools. Uh, so if we can be really good in schools, if we can, until we can get the kids vaccinated, if we can make sure they're wearing masks, if we can make sure they're distanced, if we can make sure there's good hand washing, then we can control this. Um, so another question, um, that we have, um, from, um, from some are in, in Boise. And so this is a little bit of a look back. We're now over a year, um, of, of life with COVID, hopefully looking at life after COVID. What were some of the biggest frustrations for you both during the pandemic? What would you tell past you last April, 2020, um, upon looking back, Dr. Alquist, do you want to start? Yeah, so I've been pretty frustrated. I think I think uh, one thing is it, the the the, the decision making that this required was just not in the same cadence of what we normally make decisions in, right? So, you know, what we were talking about two three months later than we should have been talking about, we were always behind. I, I used the line multiple times. We were so far behind, we thought we were in first place because we were getting laughed all the time, right? So we're we're out there just feeling good about ourselves. We're, we should have been on to the next thing a long time ago. That has continued to be a real frustration is we, we're just not set up uh, with our public health, uh, with our coordination to make decisions in a, in a way that, that we're able to be effective. And, and I would hope and pray that someone in a three ring circus, that they would start addressing public health, decision-making, how to make things better. And instead they're coming in and doing dumb stuff, right? So that's yeah. one big frustration that's only getting worse. So you would think that they would have come back this session and said, hey, let's go fix things and make it better for next time. They're making it worse. Second thing, and then I'll stop because I could keep going on. Uh, the, the, so the first thing is just the speed of what we did. Uh, the second thing is, I think we needed better clarity on messaging because what could have been a public health, hey, let's all get together and let's do this for our neighbors and for everyone else and make this thing, keep businesses open, let's keep keep our economy going, became a political battle. 
that was really frustrating for, I think for Dr. Payton, I, anyone in healthcare, we're used to people, we're used to not being second guessed on our intentions. Uh, for years, you sit with a patient in a room, you pull up the stool, you look them in the eye and you say, hey, I'm here to help you. And they believe you. And, you, and you're, you're saying, we're, we're in this together. Let's, let's do this together. And for the first time in my lifetime, healthcare workers were, you know, doctors are falsifying records. Um, hospitals just want to get money. This isn't, and it just, for, for people that were in the trenches, like a lot of my friends on the front line, even in Blaine County at the start, they're like, I, I don't understand this because I've never had my intentions uh, questioned. And I, and I blame that straight to the top. I think you look back now at tweets from, from President Trump and from his administration, they thrived on misinformation early and we never caught up from it. So that's, that's two of my big frustrations. Uh, and, and then lastly, I think we didn't learn from, I don't think we learned from, David's brought this up a whole bunch today and he had a great quote last time we did this. We don't learn from our history. And he's like talking not about history way back, but just like last month, how come we can't learn from things that have happened, mistakes that were made six months ago? We seem, I've used this line too, we seem to snatch victory out of, I mean, defeat out of the jaws of victory, right? Why can't we just learn from our mistakes and, and do something better? But I'll stop there, Nicole, because I, I wouldn't stop all day. It's been very frustrating here. But we're, the good news is we're optimistic now. We're going to make it. Yeah, and I, I I won't repeat everything that Dr. Alquist said because I agree with it, and I, I don't want to take up the time for that. Let me just add on a few things. Uh, you know, the in addition to the frustrations, one is I, I can tell you I've been pandemic planning for twenty years or so. Uh, these the first message that well, who could have ever imagined this? Well, the answer was every physician, every scientist, every healthcare leader, because we've been planning for this for 20 years. The thing that really surprised me is I thought this, this national strategic stockpile, I thought it is going to have everything we need. We're, we're going to be set. And what we found out is it had hardly anything. And we're going to have to come to grips with that. Either there's going to be have to be a commitment on the part of Congress to fund that and keep that, or we've got a decision as a state to to make. Are we going to do we need to have our own strategic stockpile? Um, so I think that's uh, an issue. Um, another thing is, I think what's going to be important is, uh, you know, have we learned anything from this? Because as bad as this was. Let me tell you, I know Dr. Alquist and I could sit here for the rest of the time of the show and name off viruses that could easily become pandemic and have higher mortality rate. In a way, as horrendous as this has been, in a way, we got off easy because there are viruses that have 10 times the mortality, 30 times the mortality that that COVID uh, has. And so the question is, uh, while the legislature is taking all these steps to make sure that we are not capable of taking a state response or even local response to a, the next pandemic, what if it is one of these really bad ones? And, uh, you know, I, I think the legislature is incredibly foolish because they're not serving the people. This is not putting us in a better spot. But with that said, it is what it is. I'm not going to change that. <clears throat> what I would say, as they're taking away all the uh, authorities and powers from the public health districts, so that basically they're just going to be advisory, then at least have them give us good advice. And if if we're not going to have any mandates, at least make sure it's good information. So if if you don't want to give them any power, then at least get rid of the the boards or the people on those boards that don't even subscribe to public health things. Because if we don't have the option of mandates in the future when something's really severe, then at least we need to make sure we're getting good information out to people so that they can protect themselves. Because uh, uh, with the actions of this legislature, you know, the next uh, pandemic, it's gonna be every man or woman for himself. Um, it, it's, it's a shame, but that's what it's gonna be. 
I want to take a, a couple of, of minutes that we have left to make sure we can answer some of the questions that we're getting over Facebook. And so some of it may be retreading previous ground, but I think it's people have still a lot of questions about the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And so one is from um, um, a woman in Boise who says, what about women who want to become pregnant? Is the vaccine a problem for them? I've heard conflicting information. Um, I don't know who wants to start first on this one. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I've, I, I had a great question from one of my friends at about 11 o'clock at night about this. And I immediately texted David Pate and said, hey, give me the date on it. So I'll let him take it because that was, was where I went. Yeah, well, thanks, uh, Tommy. And so, yes, this vaccine looks like it's very safe. Uh, there's clinical trials going on looking at pregnant women. But let me tell you what we have seen so far. First of all, uh, the rumors that the vaccine would somehow impact infertility, that was, uh, that's the advantage of social media taking off with two people who were anti-vaxxers that wrote to the European CDC to suggest that this would happen with no evidence. And in fact, it's completely false. So, if, if it's the fertility issue, don't worry about that. These vaccines do not cause infertility. Second, is it safe? What I would say is if you are planning or intending to get pregnant uh, in the near future, go ahead and get vaccinated now. We know that's perfectly safe. Um, the second thing is we do know that when you're pregnant, you are at higher risk and worse outcomes for you and your baby. So it is important for you to get vaccinated. And the growing evidence is that we're seeing that this looks perfectly safe in, in, uh, in, during your pregnancy. Check with your obstetrician and see if you have any special circumstances. But my guess is your obstetrician will actually recommend you be vaccinated if you haven't. We're seeing additional benefits. When uh, women are vaccinated, it looks like, like with many other um, uh, immune conditions, that the mother transfers antibodies to that newborn, at least for the first several months. So, you know, there's no scenario where we're going to be vaccinating uh, babies under the age six months. So, fact, frankly, the mother having antibodies is going to be a big uh, benefit. And then finally, uh, I just saw, and I haven't had the time to, to dig into it, but I just saw a report that actually uh, we also saw some protection from women who are breastfeeding uh, their infants. So I would say if you're planning to get pregnant, get vaccinated now. If you're already pregnant, talk to your obstetrician. It's probably a good idea you get vaccinated. Um, I have a, another question um, that is we received a lot of um, just from readers. Um, I can't tie to a specific one, so I'll summarize. Travel after being vaccinated, especially tra travel um, via plane, other areas where you may be in enclosed spaces with other people, even if you're wearing masks. What are what are the best practices? What would you what would you recommend, Dr. Pate? You want to start? Yeah. So what I would say is for the next couple of months, uh, I wouldn't be traveling just to travel. Uh, now, the CDC says it's OK to uh, travel if you're vaccinated, uh, uh, but they've kind of gone back and forth. And I think the reason is, yes, if you're vaccinated, you're going to have a lot of protection. But uh, I suspect, uh, you know, police officers that are wearing an, uh, a bulletproof vest still try not to get shot at. Uh, and so the same thing is, if you're vaccinated, that's wonderful. It's going to give you a tremendous protection, but you still don't want to put yourself in really uh, high risk situations. I, I would say that, you know, give it a couple months um, before you travel. If you really need to travel, then I think the question is, what are your own particular risks? How high risk are you if you get infected? And, and second of all, where are you traveling to? Uh, right now, I wouldn't recommend that you travel to Canada. I wouldn't recommend that you travel to the Northeast. I wouldn't recommend that you travel to Michigan. Uh, now, there's a lot of other places that, you know, the activity is not near uh, so high. I, I certainly don't think this is a time for international travel, but we will get there. But we're, I just think give it a couple months unless you really do need to travel. If you really do need to travel, be careful. It's 
everything in the whole line of traveling. Uh, you know, how are you going to get to the airport and who are you going to be with? Are you going to be in an Uber or are you going to be one of your family members taking you? Um, and uh, what are you going to do in the, the restaurant, uh, in the um, uh, airport? Are you going to be able to distance? Uh, and then again on the plane, uh, and for God's sakes, make sure you're wearing your mask. Be careful about people that take their masks off to eat or drink on the plane or same thing for you. Um, well, another question here um, is from Crystal and Eagle. Um, what do you think college and K through 12 school will look like this coming fall? Will it look more like fall 2019 or fall 2020? And I'll add something here. What do you think it should look like maybe versus what you think it will end up looking like? I don't know who wants to tackle that one first. I could take that one, Nicole. We're... Um believe it or not, in Massachusetts with the school districts there, in California with several of the school districts there, in Texas and in Tennessee, Crush the Curve is actually helping school districts right now get ready for the fall. So unlike last year where we were just too late to get ready with any testing to keep them open, um, I think you'll see school districts around the country. First of all, uh, the administration has allocated large amounts of money to try to help people stay open and stay safe. And so I think you'll see more testing early on to try to do surveillance testing uh, to make sure that when you do have an outbreak in a school that it's, 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 it's uh, tested and we, we shut it down. It's kind of what we should have done last year, but we weren't ready for it. So I don't think we're going to be out of the woods. I don't think you're not going to have any testing. I think you're going to have protocols in place that, says, that say, hey, if you're, if you're sick, stay home and, and you're going to get tested. And there's a lot of really cool technology out there called pod testing where where you're putting multiple samples into one container. So the cost comes way down. And it's a great way to do surveillance testing just to make sure you catch COVID cases early, isolate them and let disease burden stay low. And, and I think that's gonna be the key. Um, we, one of the things that we don't talk enough about is how much disease burden is in a specific community. If disease burden is very high, then it's very, very risky. And if disease burden is low and we're able to test for it and contain it, then, then it's different. And hopefully by then we have disease burdens that are low. We have protocols that allow us to test and isolate and we keep it very low and we're vaccinated. And that's the secret, com that's the combo to stay open is good protocols to test, disease burden low. And, and that's my hope. And, and I think, and I do believe around the country, lots and lots of places are getting ready for that already. Um, and you'll and you'll see universities stay open and schools stay open uh, with the help from testing and protocols. Yeah, those are fantastic points. Let me just add uh, to that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, people are, are uh, a lot of people got mad at me this year because they thought I was trying to keep people out of school. I was trying to keep people in school, but safely. People don't realize we could have had all the kids in school all this year. We, we could have if we had planned last summer. And what would it have taken? You, you know, the Idaho statesman just reported there's a $400 million surplus in the education budget for, for Idaho. I was talking back then about, look, what we got to do, the key is, is let's distance kids. We can't in your current facilities. So let's get tents, let's get temporary buildings, Let's take the technology that you have. If you can do remote learning, and I understand we don't do that well, which that's a whole nother issue to be in 2020 and not be able to do that. But you could teach, a, a teacher could divide a classroom between the regular class and a temporary building, and you could use the technology to be teaching in, in both rooms, but yet keep students uh, distance. The reason we had to go hybrid is there just wasn't enough space, but, but we had the money. We've had the opportunity. We're getting more money from the federal government to reopen schools. So I think we need to make some smart investments. 
uh, we've got some schools that are where um, uh, you've had so much population growth, but you've had no growth in the school facility. And so there's a lot of crowding. We need to look at how do we expand some of these school buildings? Because uh, again, Dr. Alquist and I have said, this isn't going to be our last pandemic. So how can we increase the spacing? How could we use temporary buildings until we can? Um, things like that. Uh, but the other key that I just want to emphasize is I do think vaccines are going to be come available for younger kids. And we need those parents to take their kids and get them vaccinated because that's a great way to get us back in full-time school. What I worry about is we hear numbers like, well, 20% of people are uh, vaccine hesitant. Well, it's if it's 20%, then it's more than 20 because a lot of those people have kids. And if they're vaccine hesitant, they're not going to let their kids get vaccinated. And so we've got to get kids vaccinated to get ready for next year. Thank you both. We're coming to the end of our time here, actually just past one. I have one last question I'd like to squeeze in for both of you. Um, did you did either of you make any lifestyle changes due to this pandemic that you think you're going to keep doing, keep or just refrain from doing maybe even after, you know, we hit the benchmarks that you'll feel that we talked about at the beginning that you'll feel comfortable with? Um, Dr. Alquist, do you want to start anything you changed that you think you'll probably keep doing even after COVID is hopefully less of a risk? Nicole, I can't believe you're bringing up the 15 pounds I gained. <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> you know, you know, I I do believe uh, one one of my really good friends, Mike Boren, who was part of our Curse the Curve crew early on, like early early on, when everyone was panicking and then, what are we going to do last March? I'll never forget. I was sitting with him and he said, "Listen, every single time in my life when there's been a crisis that's come up to me, either my family, me personally, or my business, I've always come out of it better." And he said, we're gonna learn a lot of things from this pandemic and it's gonna be horrible and hard, but we will come out of it better. I think there is a lot of a lot of room for optimism. I think our, our public health, like uh, Dr. Pate said, we're gonna be better prepared next time for what's happening. Our national stockpiles are gonna be better. And I think individually, we're gonna wash our hands better. We're gonna, we're gonna stay home when we're sick. Some of the basic stuff that we've said as physicians, I've been watching some of the viewer comments. Someone said, well, these guys have never seen patients. Baloney. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen over 50,000 patients in my career, 50,000. And a lot of the things that we've been telling all those patients, you know, wash your hands, stay home if you're sick, all the things that have been good infectious disease, things that you learn in medical school, we're going to do more of them. And you're going to have better, better hygiene, better, you know, things that work and, and protocols for the way you do things. There's a, there's things that we're going to be better. So hopefully we all come out of this with some ways that we do things differently. And I certainly have. Um, and I think that society will as well. Yeah, I think for me, um, you know, one of the things that I will do differently is that I now carry around sanitizer with me, uh, which I didn't do before. So I have hand sanitizer with me. Uh, when I do grow the grocery store, I'm always wiping down the carts and so forth and my hands and so forth. Um, that'll be one thing. You know, I've wondered if I'd ever get back to shaking hands. Um, uh, frankly, I'm a hugger, uh, so I don't know how that's going to turn out. But um, I know the other day somebody is reached out their hand to shake my hands and I immediately went to my, you know, to do the elbow bump. So that may be a permanent thing. We'll have to see. Um, and I think that probably there will still be some circumstances where I will, you know, because... I'm an old guy. You guys are young. And and um, I, I probably still will mask on occasion for particularly high high risk situations in the future um, that I didn't before. I, I can remember before COVID being on a plane and the fool sitting across the aisle from me coughing like crazy. And and I, every time he coughed, I was just like, you know, this, because I, I, I knew I was going to get sick. And sure, I did. And so I may wear masks on airplanes from now on. Um, and, and, and we've seen what this does to decrease flu. 
you know, maybe maybe I'll wear a mask during the um, flu season in the future, even when COVID's not a concern. Just that, you know, I've had influenza before. The last time I had it was when I was an intern in the emergency room. And I pledged ever since then, I will get a shot every single year. I never want to have that again. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pate and Dr. Alquist, for talking with us today, for sharing what you know, for being very forthright with your opinions and your experience. It's much appreciated. Um, thank you to our viewers for joining us and for asking wonderful questions. You can find more COVID-19 coverage at idahostatesman.com slash coronavirus. Uh, once again, I'm Nicole Foy, an investigative reporter for The Statesman. You can support our work covering the pandemic and su support more community conversations like this one by subscribing to The Idaho Statesman. You can just go to idahostatesman.com slash subscribe. Thank you so much for tuning in and hope you and your families stay safe and stay healthy.